between pole and tropic, between obviously the, the middle of the globe and the, and the top or the bottom of the globe. When the short day is brightest with frost and fire, we think of the fog of earlier of the dry salt ages and now we're in another F word, the frost and the fire. Fire is going to be significant at line 10. It will be the Pentecostal fire here in a little bit. The brief sun flames the ice. Again, this notion of brief, right? And again, fire and flames on pond and ditches in endless, in windless coal. That is the heart's heat. The heart of the matter is, of course, here already beginning to be introduced, right? Reflecting in a watery mirror, and we're back to the sun-filled pool in the very beginning of Burt Norton. Now, I've had some of you already ask the same question we ask, for example, when we do other great writers like Dante and Shakespeare. Uh, is this all intentional? I mean, is this, uh, like we said, the number of drafts suggests that every single word is thought out very intentionally. So we're playing all kinds of games. Notice the next word at line seven. Reflecting in a watery mirror, reflection and mirrors are significant to all of our study of, 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 the, of these poems, no question, right? A glare that is blindness, we finish the poem with blindness at line 181, you can go and take a look at that. That blindness there will be in reference to the great John Milton possibly. In the early afternoon, and glow more intense than blaze of branch or brazier. You can see here more about this ideas of, um, of fire, right? Stirs the dumb spirit, no wind, but Pentecostal fire. Now this Pentecostal fire has to do, of course, in Christian theology with Acts chapter two, and the idea that when uh, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, it evinced itself, the Holy Spirit, in these tongues of fire that sat above each of their heads, right? No wind, but Pentecostal fire in the dark time of the year. And we think about Hardy's Darkling Thrush and this notion of the dark time of the year, a, a poem that we've all studied, I've given a lecture on. Between melting, again we're back to between, melting and freezing, the soul sap quivers. Now we've already pointed out that T.S. Eliot loves his verbs, right? The soul sap quivers. Notice all the S sounds. There's no earth smell, by the way. Notice all of the senses, the five senses that are being elicited in these lines. Or smell of living thing. This is the springtime. Now, it's, it's compelling that at line 10 we have the word stirs. Now we've got the word spring, and we can't help but think about Wasteland's opening lines. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Um, and so you can tell here, Eliot is in many ways assuming everything he's written in these lines to bring somehow a symphonic culmination to all of his life's work. We'll get more to that when he visits his ghost here in a while. This is the springtime, line 13, 14, but not in times covenant, using religious language of covenant. Now the hedgerow, we're back to Burt Norton, is blanched for an hour with transitory blossom. And this poems, all these poems have been about growing and blossoms, and of course, everything is transitory. Of snow, a bloom more sudden. And that word sudden is, of course, and transitory. These are both key words for us, right? Um, and then again, this notion of blooming, everything about these poems have been, has been about growing and blooming. Think about how, how much different that is than wasteland. If there were rock and water, there's no water and only rock. Then that of summer, neither budding nor fading, not in the scheme, we're back to the word pattern again, of generation. And again, generation is growth, evolution, all of that's going to be important. And then the question, where is the summer? the unimaginable zero sum. Uh, and, and of course this notion uh, is the same question about the still point of the turning world, isn't it, right? If Bert Norton discussed air and East Coker, earth, and dry salvage is water, we are in fire here, aren't we? The blooming and the fires are our key symbols, so let's write that down at 2B. Of course this question, where is summer, right? This never ending, summer, right? The unimaginable zero summer. Well, of course, the real question is, where is happiness? Where is joy? Where is love? Where is peace? Right? That is to say, that's never ending. That's the question, isn't it? And the answer will be prayer and humility 
and love, of course, at the end of little getting, as we will see. Okay, let's turn now to lines 21 and following. And we'll begin again with the epistemological fallibilist position, as we've said in earlier lectures, that notion that you're either an absolutist in terms of what you know, I know it and I'm absolutely right and you're wrong. Sometimes, of course, we can be mistaken. Or the extreme opposite of that, the relativist position, there are no absolutes, which kind of starts to sound like an absolute. The performative contradiction says that's not a good epistemological position to be in. Which leads you to ask, well, where? The fallibilist position is somewhere in the middle, isn't it? It's the position of science. It's the position that says, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. Notice the word if already introducing us to that, just like in Burt Norton in the second line, perhaps the word that set that one up for us. If you notice the use of the word you here. Um, by the way, this right away will remind us of Burt Norton 23, shall we follow, shall we follow. If you came this way, taking the route you would be likely to take from the place you would be likely to come from. If you came this way in May time, you would find the hedges white again in May. By the way, did you notice that May is not capitalized in line 24? Uh, it is capitalized on line 25. What's going on with that? Of course, if you want to come this way, we're talking about from London, right? If you're talking about the area of Little Getting. It would be the same at the end of the journey. Well, again, this is the last of the journey for us with four quartets, and we're going to come to that notion that when you come back, you actually end up right where you started, those lines that I quoted from you for, the, uh, for you at the very end of the uh, poem. If you came at night like a broken king, this can either be a reference to Charles I. Historically, he ended up in this little church, or of course it could be Jesus uh, as well, right? If you came by day not knowing what you came for, back to more uncertainty, uh, epistemologically speaking, it would be the same when you leave the rough road and turn behind the pigsty, Again, I told you this is an obscure place, to the dull facade, this church is not a, a really like ornate kind of church, and the tombstone, that's Ferrer's tombstone. And what you thought you came for is only a shell, a husk of meaning. This quest for meaning is central to all of these poems. From which the purpose breaks only, key word in four quartets, when it is fulfilled, if at all. Either you had no purpose, second use of the word purpose, or the purpose is beyond the end you figured, the third use of the word purpose, and is altered in fulfillment. In other words, why would you ever take your time to drive outside of London to go to this little tiny obscure church in the middle of nowhere? What would be the purpose, in other words? Right? There are other places which also are the world's end. It's kind of funny that he would call this world's end. We know in England where land's end is, right? Some at the sea jaws, I mean I just mentioned land's end, sea jaws, remember the sea lips of, of, um, of dry salvages, line 184. Or over a dark lake in a desert, we think about wasteland. Or a city, we think about wasteland. I, I had not thought death hadn't done so many going over the bridge there. But this is the nearest in place and time now and in England. Now let's say something very quickly in your notes about that last line and the fact that England is mentioned. If Dry Salvages is the American poem, and it is because Dry Salvages, as we said, is off Cape Ann, Massachusetts, Little Gidding is absolutely the English poem, right? Mentioned here, mentioned at the very last line of this first section in line 55, mentioned a third time at line 239. So three times the word England gets used but it's referenced all the way through. Think about this. These lines are being written while bombs are being dropped on London. I just think that's a fascinating reality as we read some of the lines that are coming. Again, we're back to the if of line 21 at line 41. If you came this way, taking any route, notice now it's not the line 22, the route, but any route, starting from anywhere, at any time, or at any season, and we begin to realize that this repetition of the word any, any, of course, again, it's back to that notion of my words echo in your mind. That's, I think the point here is that TSLA is trying to remind us there's two ways to read all of this stuff for four quartets, literally and, of course, metaphorically or figuratively. In other words, traveling to little getting, literally, or traveling to little getting symbolically, Right, metaphorically, figuratively. Any time or any season, it would always be the same. You would have to put off resignation 
sense and notion back to our lines of, uh, from the Bhagavad Gita and our conversation in Dry Salt Ages. And then finally you're there. Now what are you here for? What is the purpose? You are not here. Notice he begins with the negative. You are not here to verify, to say, you know, to sign the little book that says you were there, to instruct yourself. You're not even looking for instruction or inform curiosity. Now that's an interesting way for him to say it because he says, I sometimes wonder, and we pointed out in Dry Salt Ages, this whole poem in the fallible disposition is predicated on the notion of curiosity, of wonder. Gee, I wonder what that's like. But he says, this is not, this is not why you're here, just so you can kind of wonder or be curious. Or carry report, you're not here to be a tourist, so that you can go back and tell other people what it's like. Well, then what are you here for? Notice he is playing the very same game that the Christian mystics will play of first telling you what God is not before trying to tell you what God is, or it's inverse oftentimes, like St. John of the Cross. You are here. And we could say here is such an important... I mean, I've often said, all you got to do is just go, get, you know, you can just go, go online or however you're working, you know, with this text right here in front of you physically on paper. And every time the word here is, is mentioned, just circle it. And go through and count up the number of times. It'll blow your mind. You are here to kneel. I, we think of that, that, that great Bono line from that U2 song, if you want to kiss the sky, better learn how to kneel. You are here to kneel where prayer has been vowed. Notice how many times the word prayer now, like a mantra, like a gong. Prayer has been done. And prayer is more than an order of words. You know, what is praying? Well, you could make the argument that these poems are all about learning how to pray. What do you mean learning how to pray? Well, you just open your mouth and you say words. No, 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 no. It's way more than that. Notice, prayer is more than an order of words. The conscious occupation of the praying mind or the sound of the voice praying. There's something beyond all of that, right? And what the dead had no speech for when living, they can tell you being dead. Now, uh, William James called this the ontological imagination, one's, able, one's capacity to be able to put oneself in, in, in another place. But we've got a very interesting bit of irony here, and several of them, and I'm going to point them all, I hope, I hope several of them out for you. Notice he says, when you're praying, it's the dead are able to speak with you. Um, they couldn't say anything when they were living, but now they can, and they can tell you being dead. Of course, remember in East Coker, part 5, lines 188, that notion of what's wrong with trying to converse with the spirits. He actually makes fun of people who try and do that through any number of ways, the crystal balls, the reading of the cards, or whatever. But notice here, it's something quite literally he takes as possible. Try to understand the paradox of that. And then, after the word dead, at line 52, you've got the colon. And these words now become some of the most important, and we would even say most read words of T.S. Eliot, because these are the words that end up at Westminster, in Poets' Corner, when uh, you go to Westminster and Poets' Corner, there were all those really important poets are all listed. Where T.S. Eliot is, these are the words. Whoa, so these are the words that they put there on that plaque. What are those words? What is prayer? And what is it that the dead are telling you? The communication of the dead is tongued with fire beyond translinguistic, the language of the living. Wow. So in other words, he's going to say what he's been saying all the way through. I keep repeating myself. Shall I repeat myself? He asks earlier. He says it again. If prayer and this whole spiritual journey, it's beyond words. It's trans translinguistic. But it has something to do with these tongues of fire, the Pentecostal fires we saw earlier. And then all of a sudden, guess what? There's the word here again. Line 54. Here, the intersection. We think about the crossroads of the Oedipal story, Oedipus Rex. We think about that coming together of harmony that Plato's project was all about. And of course, these poems have all been about. The intersection of the timeless moment is England. Little getting is in England. And nowhere, never, and always. And all of Heraclitus' conundrums and, uh, you know, the way up is the way down, those quotes, that quote from the very beginning of Burt Norton, all of that is assumed in our understanding of here we are, in our spiritual landscape, uh, uh, we might say. Well, Again, um, T.S. Eliot actually once, once said this about this section uh, regarding the dead. 
Uh, he says, we cannot fully understand a person, grasp the totality of his being until he is dead. Uh, I think that there's uh, some profound insight here that when you know someone personally, you often can't really know that person. We come to know people often long after the fact, and we begin to hear and learn things about them and the like, right? Um, a, a dear friend of mine lost his father and went to his funeral. Know his dad really well, and yet it was his friends of the father, the past father, who told him about some of the things that his father did. He'd never heard those stories. Never heard the amazing generosity of the man. And uh, so I think T.S. Eliot's point here is, is, is well taken. By the way, this notion of the dead, we're talking about now unity, right, across person and time. Well, let's jump quickly to 2A. Well, obviously... Uh, meaning begins and ends with prayer will be the argument here. Because prayer, well, you kneel, i.e. humility, right? Um, either literally kneeling or metaphorically kneeling, right? Abasing, however you wish to think of it. At level 2B, well, obviously the symbols here are fire. But I, I also want to point out that I think the symbol here is also England. England, And, and, and while he's writing these, these lines, the question, it blows our minds to think about it today, is literally in his mind and in the mind of his English readers and everybody else who would read this, not even English, will there be an England in the future? I mean, you know, there was, there was uncertainty, tremendous fear about that. At 3A, well, it, it, so, so often we've mentioned Wasteland, so we'll say it one more time. In many ways, Four Quartets is a response to Wasteland. Remember those last words of Wasteland, Shanti, 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 that peace, that um, notion of peace which passeth all understanding. Finally, in 3B, we're trying to relate this to you. Well, what are your thoughts about prayer? I mean, do you think of prayer as something important? Why or why not? Within the, within the contemplative traditions, we often will talk about prayer as being different types of things, right? I mean, it can be a prayer that's moving versus uh, your body is moving in some way versus a prayer that is you know, sitting and doing some kind of still meditation or prayer or whatever, right? What are your thoughts about it? Why do you think prayer is important? Why or why not? Okay, let's continue now. We're at Little Getting Part 2. We'll call this the Compound Ghost. This is a significant uh, section of the Four Quartets um, because uh, we've got all kinds of different things happening here that will not happen anywhere else in Four Quartets. By the way, this is lines 56 to 151, or if you're doing the cumulative count, 681 to 776. Um, notice that in all of the Four Quartets in Section 2, we've got the formal lyric which then leads to a longer line kind of temporal illumination. In this case, it's going to be the ghost, right? Now, we're going to want to look very quickly at the structure of lines 56 to 79. But let's begin first with just the reading. So I'm going to challenge you again. Pay attention. Conquer monkey mind. Here we go. Um, little getting part two. Ash on an old man's sleeve is all the ash the burnt roses leave. Dust in the air suspended marks the place where the story ended. Dust in breathed was a house, the wall, the wainscot, and the mouse. The death of hope and despair. This is the death of air. There are flood and drought over the eyes and in the mouth. Dead water and dead sand contending for the upper hand. The parched, eviscerate soil gapes at the vanity of toil, laughs without mirth. This is the death of earth. Water and fire succeed the town, the pasture, and the weed. Water and fire deride the sacrifice that we denied. Water and fire shall rot the marred foundations we forgot of sanctuary and choir. This is the death of water and fire. In the uncertain hour before the morning, near the ending of interminable night, at the recurrent end of the unending, after the dark dove with the flickering tongue had passed below the horizon of his homing, while the dead leaves still rattled on like tin over the ash felt where no other sound was, between three districts whence the smoke arose, I met one walking, loitering and hurried, as if blown towards me like the metal leaves before the urban dawn wind unresisting. And as I fixed upon the downturned face, that pointed scrutiny with which we challenged the first met stranger in the waning dusk, 
I caught the sudden look of some dead master whom I had known, forgotten, half recalled, both one and many, in the brown-baked features, the eyes of a familiar compound ghost, both intimate and unidentifiable. So I assumed a double part and cried, and heard another's voice cry, What, are you here? Although we were not. I was still the same, knowing myself, yet being someone other, and he a face still forming. Yet the words sufficed to compel the recognition they preceded, and so compliant to the common wind, too strange to each other for misunderstanding, in concord at this intersection time of meeting nowhere, no before and after, we trod the pavement in a dead patrol. I said, the wonder that I feel is easy, yet ease is cause of wonder. Therefore speak, I may not comprehend, may not remember. And he, I am not eager to rehearse my thought and theory which you have forgotten. These things have served their purpose, let them be. So with your own, and pray they be forgiven by others, as I pray you to forgive both bad and good. Last season's fruit is eaten, and the full-fed beast shall kick the empty bale. For last year's words belong to last year's language, and next year's words await another voice. But as the passage now presents no hindrance to the spirit unappeased and peregrine between two worlds become much like each other, so I find words I never thought to speak, in streets I never thought I should revisit when I left my body on a distant shore. Since our concern was speech, and speech impelled us to purify the dialect of the tribe and urge them